All right, so we're going to get started. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the event at the Middle East Institute. I am Laura Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. It is our pleasure to be hosting us here with MEI. We are very, very pleased uh, to have this panel today. We have two guests in town from Israel, Palestine. You're both from Haifa, yes? No, I'm Nazareth. Nazareth and Haifa. So it's my friend Jafar from Losawa and Nabila, who is a feminist leader. You're gonna get a full introduction from my friend and colleague Deborah Shoshan from Americans for Peace Now. So I am now going to exit the stage, allow Deborah to start this off with introductions, and then she is going to manage sort of an interview discussion. And then when she's ready, she'll open this up to discussion with the audience. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, Laura. Let me, let me see if I can stick this in its uh, appropriate little place here. Can everyone hear me okay? Usually not an issue that I have, but let's just, let's just make sure we're good here. Um, so I want to welcome all of you today. This is um, an extraordinary day. I, I'm sure you don't have to tell all of you. Um, and on this extraordinary day uh, in this country for very different reasons, um, I, I was actually expecting a, a smaller turnout than this, uh, with many people uh, glued to C-SPAN, and I'm just really glad uh, that, that, that you all did come out for this really, um, really very important topic uh, related, to, uh, related to governance in Israel, peace in Israel-Palestine, uh, and a discussion of the nation-state law with our, our two very esteemed guests. Um, so let me introduce uh, Jafar and Nabila and say a word or two about the Mosawa Center, uh, say just a very little bit about the nation state law. Then I'm going to conduct a, a, a conversation, as Laura said, uh, with these two great, uh, wonderful guests. And we will definitely have time for your questions as well. So I just ask you as we go, if you have questions, please make a note. Um, and we'll be sure to provide an opportunity for questions and discussion. We have a small enough group that I think uh, we could do we can do a nice job of discussion. So, um, Jafar Farah is the founder and the director of the Mosawa Center. It is the advocacy center for Arab citizens in Israel. Uh, Jafar is a longtime advocate and activist for civil rights within uh, Israel's Palestinian Arab community. As a community organizer and an activist, he was involved in planning and establishing several organizations, such as ILAM, ACAP, the Arab Center for Alternative Planning, and also the follow-up committee for Arab education in Israel. Before establishing Mosawa, Jafar worked as a journalist uh, for the local network of Haaretz, and as well also worked as a TV producer. Sitting right next to me on my left is Nabila Espanoli. Uh, as Laura said, she is a feminist activist as well as a peace activist. She founded the Pedagog Pedagogical Center and Multipurpose Women's Center in Nazareth uh, called Al Tufula in 1989. And she served as the director of that organization ever since that time. She has an MA in psychology from Bamberg University in Germany and a BA in social work from Haifa University. Um, let me just say a few words uh, for those who would like to know more about the Mosawa Center and its mission. The Mosawa Center is the advocacy center for Palestinian Arab citizens in Israel. Uh, the organization is about 20 years old, having been established in 1997 and it promotes the economic, social, and cultural, uh, as well as political rights of Palestinian Arab citizens in Israel. It also promotes the recognition of this community as a national indigenous minority in Israel. The center develops programs to promote a democratic society, and it acts against all forms of discrimination that are based on race, nationalism, religious affiliation, social status, gender, and disabilities. 
Now, just a few words about the nation state law, which of course we will be discussing uh, in detail as well as its impact today. Uh, the nation state law is a basic law now that it has been passed in July of this year, which is to say that in Israel, a country that does not have a constitution, uh, it is part of a body of law that is the closest thing that Israel has uh, to constitutional status. Uh, the law was passed, it's worth, I think, saying just a word about the context. Uh, at the very end of the most recent session of Knesset in July, and it was one of a set of illiberal measures that was passed at that time uh, by Prime Minister Netanyahu's governing coalition, uh, which are likely to undermine liberal democracy, minority rights, and also to entrench the occupation in Israel at the cost of peace. Uh, some of those other measures that were passed during that week uh, included a bill uh, that would not include recognition of surrogacy rights for gay men, uh, and also a very important piece of legislation for, for those of us who are active on the peace front that would give district courts in Israel the right to adjudicate administrative cases within the West Bank, which is really uh, a step uh, in the slow march toward uh, extending Israeli sovereignty over the West Bank, this process of annexation. So it happened within that context, the nation state law uh, passed narrowly uh, with the support of the coalition. The vote was 62 in favor, and I believe 55, 56 again, 55 against, yes, thank you. Um, so we will discuss, of course, today the impact on uh, democracy, liberal democracy in Israel, uh, the impact, of course, uh, on minority communities in Israel especially, and we'll also talk about the impact on the occupation, uh, given that the law may be interpreted uh, to apply to the occupied territory. So there's a, a lot for us to, to dig our teeth into here. So with that, and with the understanding that I will proceed by asking some questions, and I, I appreciate so much the opportunity to be here with you today uh, and, and to speak with you. Uh, thank you both so much for being here. I will ask some questions, uh, and Nabila and Jafar will uh, answer my questions as they wish and interject what they like uh, to make sure that they get their messages across as well. Um, so having said that, I want to start with something that happened just today. Uh, for those of us who forced ourselves to tear our eyes away from the Kavanaugh hearings, uh, we saw that there were also speeches going on at the UN General Assembly today uh, that both Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave speeches at the UN General Assembly today, and both of them, in fact, addressed the nation-state law. Uh, first, we had uh, President uh, Abbas who said that Israel's Knesset in adopting the nation state law has adopted a racist law that will inevitably lead to the creation of an apartheid state in Israel. It nullifies the two state solution and is the epicenter of discrimination, uh, said President Abbas. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu took umbrage at this statement. Uh, he said, only Israel is denigrated for celebrating its unique identity. Uh, he said it was outrageous that Abbas would say that the nation state law proves that Israel is a racist apartheid state. Uh, and he said, you know, what is wrong? Uh, he referred to one of the components, one of the clauses within the nation state law that would demote Arabic from its status as an official language uh, to make Hebrew the only official language of Israel. He said, What's wrong with that? What's wrong with, uh, in a democracy, with the majority deciding uh, what its official language will be? So I'd like to start from, from that vantage point in the United Nations and, and ask my, both of my guests if they would comment uh, on, on those two perspectives that we heard at the UN General Assembly today. Look at the uh, national state level. It's, we have to look at the context 
as you say, and at the, uh, the uh, environment that this law has been uh, developed in. This law actually for the last seven years was on the agenda of the uh, parliament and uh, within these, uh, in, in this time, and in this period of, of time and previous to that, many other uh, laws which were uh, reflect, uh, actually, uh, shrinking the space for uh, the uh, civil society organization, for human rights organization, and for the uh, Palestinian minority inside Israel were uh, adapted by this uh, government. Actually, the, the government, uh, so it is not only the only uh, law that it is problematic, and that it, uh, 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 but in that context, we have an atmosphere of uh, 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 laws, uh, creating laws, creating an infrastructure that actually contradict the uh, uh, definition of the state in, in its uh, old definition. We have democratic and Jewish, and we actually were also struggling around this issue, saying that there is contradiction between being democratic and being Jewish, and we were hoping to see and to uh, strengthen the, the democratic values within, within uh, Israel. And we were saying that actually there is a dangerous for democracy for the last uh, 20 years, 30 years. Some of you have been uh, uh, witnessing that process and that legalization of the situation inside, inside Israel. So the law came as a, 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 an, an actual de facto, the situation of the Palestinian minority inside Israel we were uh, saying, uh, uh, at least we were in a, in a status of second-class citizen. Normally, I am, as a feminist Palestinian, I was saying we are uh, in the 10th, uh, the Palestinian women, we are on the 10th level after Ishkenazi men, Ishkenazi women, Sephardi men, Sephardi women, uh, Russian men, Russian women, Ethiopian men, Ethiopian women, recognizing that the fact in Israel, it's not an equal, uh, 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 society, it's a society of a lot of diversity, but it's a lot of inequalities. And seeing that we, as Palestinian national uh, uh, group inside Israel, we are uh, 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 in, in that in that uh, priority of the government. We are used at the lowest level of the government. This was the fact, and we were struggling against it, and we were hoping. And, uh, and trying to reach out for the uh, Jewish public and for the whoever care about the, the future of Israel, uh, to say that this is not the future that we want to uh, uh, to see, and that there is a hope to change. Now this law comes and uh, put a fact, which is basic basic law, on 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 that hopes and actually closing the possibility of a political uh, uh, struggle or not. I'm not giving up, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, making the political uh, work more much much harder, and the de facto situation is legitimized. And giving that, uh, it, it's all the, the different uh, aspects of the law is actually uh, uh, we we see it as uh, uh, but it's it's uh, uh, against any. Uh, democratic values, if we're speaking about equality, no basic law in Israel has the uh, uh, issue of equality with it, within it. Not on, with the nation, national uh, 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 status law now, it's uh, putting discrimination as part of the legitimate tool against the minority inside Israel, but not only against the minority in Israel, because in the wording of the uh, uh, no, there is a, a speech about self-determination for the Jews within the state of Israel, and they're looking at the historical uh, 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 Palestine or the great Israel as part of, of uh, uh, in the world, it, it's used both state of Israel and the uh, uh, great uh, uh, Eretz Israel, land uh, of Israel. So, uh, and this is another obstacle for peace and for the two-state solution that we're, we're uh, advocating for or and thinking that this is the only possibility for a beginning. I mean, the two-state solution wouldn't solve the problem, but it is, will uh, create an opportunity 
for a better living together for a, 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 a situation. That's why I am, from, uh, uh, as a person and individual and a political person, I uh, was still believe that this is the only possibility for a future in within that country. But also recognizing that even the uh, two states wouldn't solve the problem because we, as Palestinian national minority, the 20 percent of the uh, uh, citizens of Israel, we are there, and we're not going to fly anywhere. We're not going to move anywhere. So you have to deal with us, and you have to accept the fact that we are uh, that uh, our prison. This means that we have to create a common future. And what will be this common future with that law? The common the the, the law actually close the possibility for a discourse which present alternative for the Jews inside Israel to be part of the Arab world, to be part of the region, to be part of the uh, uh, acceptance, the, I mean, working about the existence of, accepting the existence of Israel would never be by negating the existence of the Palestinians, would never be possible by negating the acceptance of the uh, uh, understanding that uh, historically we have two people here that are struggling for the same uh, <coughs> homeland and what will happen. I mean, we have different in discourse, we have different in, in, uh, in the, the history, but we have to uh, uh, deal with our differences and instead of dealing with our differences, we are creating more border to close up this potential uh, possibility. Look, you know, first I'm happy to be here, to see friends, and to think together what can be done. I think this is an opportunity to challenge this apartheid mentality that has been mainstreamed in the last 20 years by the settlers. This is the settlers' law. They are promoting separation, they are promoting wars, they are promoting discrimination. This is what they are doing for the last 20 years, at least systematically. For us, for the first time, the Arab community was leading big demonstration in Tel Aviv with the Palestinian flags, and inviting the Jewish population come and join us on our struggle. It's not our struggle. It's the struggle of the democratic forces in Israel against the settlers' mentality. They think that what was what, what, what failed in South Africa can work in Israel. They have been implementing for the last 50 years a system of two laws. Law for the settlers and law for the Palestinians. The Palestinians are good to be workers in building the settlements and the factories, and they will be the hosts of the land. It can't work. They want to try it with us now. They feel that they are strong enough, and unfortunately, the democratic forces in Israel are not clear enough. And I mean democratic forces in Israel I mean, even people like Kahlon, Yashk Kulano, she came on the agenda, he, they came on the agenda of like social justice. And this is the proof that social justice in Israel is not enough. Now, it's a challenge for us, country without equality. You know, have been promoted also by part of the people here as the only democracy in the, in the Middle East. No, Israel is not democracy without equality. And it's an opportunity for all of us to use it and to build groups that can work for different discourse. The discourse of separation, the discourse of occupation, the discourse of, it, it, this is, was the discourse until now. This is like, they want to, to shut down the dream. You know, it's like Martin, Martin Luther King with the dream, I dream, you know, we dream, you know, Musawam is equality. This was the dream, equality. There is no equality, and you know why there is no equality in Israel? In any, any, any basic law, not because of this. Because of women's status. Because the religious groups in Israel don't want equality for women 
and of course not for gay and lesbians, and not for reformed Jews, and we are on the list. So in this sense, in the system in Israel, there is a classes. Already, it's just shut down the dream of the Palestinian community in Israel. Now it's either the democratic forces with the Arab community, or the settlers, and the settlers today are leading the discourse in Israel and here, you know, the discourse of Trump is a discourse is not far away from this discourse of superiority toward the region. We are the owners of this land. We will teach you. We will control you. Now, it will not work because we resist. And it will not work because we have also Jewish progressive forces here in the U.S., but also inside Israel. And what was done, it's like, because it's an opportunity for us. The next, the last election, it was almost about either Rota Arnold and Israel. It was between Sheldon Edelson and his friends, okay, and the Rota Arnold. This is an opportunity for us to go for once, for election in Israel, to put on the table which country this will be. Country of occupation, country of discrimination, or country of solidarity, country of democracy, country of equality. Country of open borders. The whole failure of the left in Israel that they proposed with Oslo agreement, Jewish state, actually, they opened the window for the settlers. Jewish state, they will be there, we will be here. Obama, well, you know, promoted Jewish states and rights for all its citizens. It's similar to this. No. It had to be the agenda that we should promote today. We should put, you know, like the failure of the left in Israel. It's not a question of Abi Gabai or a question of, uh, what's his name? Herzog. <laughs> it's not a question of like these two leaders. It's the question of vision. You have, you know, in any, in any organizational development, in any, uh, you know, the first thing that you, it's not only to nominate candidates. It's first to check if your vision is still relevant. And the current vision of the progressive forces in Israel is not relevant. It fell down in 2000, in October 2000, when we gave the majority to Ehud Barak, and they killed our citizens in the streets. And it was because this whole separation. You will be there, two-state solution, they will be there, we will be here. The Arab minority in Israel is 20%. It's not like the Jewish Americans, 2%. But 20% of the population, you can say, we will guarantee collective rights to the Jewish majority, and we will neglect the Arab minority. So I'm happy that 555 MKs were together this time for the first time for you, for, for the decades actually. They were standing together against this law. I hope that we will be able to go to the next election in Israel on this issue. Do you want to have democracy or you want to be the state of the settlers, the white settlers, the settlers of South Africa, the settlers of apartheid? And we have to be clear. We are not interested, not we, the Arabs, alone. We and the Jewish progressive voices, we have to come out and say clearly, this is not the vision, this is not the future that we want to design for ourselves and for our kids. And we have to be clear also here in the US. You have midterm election here, guys. It's very important that you go and vote, but it's very important to tell the American decision makers, especially in the Democratic Party that sit today in the opposition here, hey, if you will go back and, and control the White House, make sure don't sacrifice the minority rights. Because you, when you sacrifice us in, the, uh, uh, in your policy, foreign policy, then somebody will understand that he can create a apartheid regime inside Israel. We have to be clear from now. This is an opportunity for us to campaign and to shift the discourse in Israel, and if we lose it, it will be, you know, the settlers today are planning confrontations between the Arab community and the state institutions in between now and the election. You were there in October 2000. You saw the whole commission record guys. We know that nothing happened to strengthen democracy. It means that we have to face the reality in Israel and to learn the lessons from what happened until now. This is an opportunity for all of us. We have to take it because many 
Jewish citizens, even the elderly, you know, even the ADL, they stand and said, you know what, this is an apartheid. We are, it's not accepted. This is an opportunity for all of us to come back to Israel, to come back to the Jewish public and say, what you want for the future of your kids? We will not accept to be second class citizens and not seventh class citizens. We will fight for our rights. We expect you, and I, I'm, I'm sure that the gathering here and all the, our meetings is part of the solidarity. But solidarity is not enough. Solidarity will mean that you should tell your representatives, your decision makers here, to support minority rights when it comes to Israel and to support us and cooperate with us to build the real democracy in Israel and also in Palestine. And to end the occupation is not the end of the story in the Palestinian side. We need to have also democracy in the Palestinian side. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, I have two questions that I want to proceed with from this point that I think are related, and I'll let you address them as you as you will, of course. I won't let you. I'll invite you. I'll invite you to do that. Um, so I want to start with the A word uh, that you use several times, Jafar, in your answer. I'm referring, of course, to apartheid. Um, this is, a, this is a word that uh, Jewish Americans, liberals, even those who are critical of Israel, um, have for a long time uh, been... Uh, no, I, I, to the contrary, I would say, if, they've been, if we've been using it, it's been warning that Israel might, so, you know, we have to prevent it from sliding into an apartheid-like state. But there's a real, uh, I mean, particularly because Jewish Americans were so active in the struggle in South Africa, there's, there's a real, um, I think, visceral desire not to see Israel as, as comparable to uh, the situation in South Africa under apartheid. So I'd like to give you the opportunity should you choose to accept it, to talk about it in concrete terms, both for those here and for those uh, who may watch later, as, as we're being uh, uh, videotaped here for posterity, um, to talk about specifically, what do you see? How is Israel developing into a state uh, for which the term apartheid would be appropriate? And specifically, in terms of the nation state law, how is the nation state law moving that process forward in a disturbing fashion? Um, so that's my first question, which I'm sure would be enough in and of itself. But uh, I want to bring up something um, that also comes out of, of the comments uh, from both of you. And that has to do with solidarity, solidarity with progressive Jewish Israelis. Um, I'd like to know uh, your sense of the extent to which you're seeing progress on that front in terms of forging alliances uh, with Jewish Israelis, and are you satisfied with what you're seeing? Do you think there's support for the kind of vision that you've just articulated here? Separation and housing somehow is important. Separation in workplaces somehow is a problem. Separation of families, okay? Since 2003, there is a temporary law. It will not be temporary law anymore. Mm -hmm. When we went to the court to say, hey guys, you know, mixed marriages, we are 1.5 million Palestinians that have to get married to only 1.5 million. It's like to tell Jewish Americans get married only from Jewish Americans. Some people like this idea. But you prevent Palestinians living inside Israel from uh, falling in love and, and, and married with Palestinians from East Jerusalem or from, you know, there's a village called Batal City, called Batal Arbi, and there's Batal Shapri, and there's Barta, and Barta Shapri, like villages on the border. No, you can't, man. You know, I go to the bank, and the guy there, his name is Sudan. He's keep telling me, okay, when my, my wife, like for 17 years they are married, they have kids and etc. They have to go to Jordan to fly because they can't fly from Big Gurion Airport because his wife 
can't get an Israeli passport to allow her to, to, to fly from Tel Aviv uh, airport. This separation, if you go today to the Supreme Court, they will reject the appeal. They rejected the appeal already in the past, but it was temporary law and security reasons. Today there is no need. Already in two cases, the courts in Israel said, we will use this law. This is a basic law. Today, today there's, you know, it's a new law and there is no regulations, and already judges in the Israeli courts are using it. So for example, a kid, and I saw it, a kid, was uh, on, on an electronic bicycle. He was stopped in Haifa, and they give him fine for 1,000 shekels. 1,000 shekels, 13 and a half years old. And I came to the police officer and said, you know, you ask the kid questions. You don't, answer, you don't understand what you ask him. You have an obligation to investigate him with his parents or somebody else. The answer was the police officer. It's a Jewish state. 1,000 shekels. This kid have to pay 1,000 shekel on behalf of the Jewish state. You know, like, this police is not willing to, to understand that the law, there is an obligation. You have to sit with this kid with his parents, and you have to talk to him in Arabic. No, it's, the answer is Jewish state. So practically, from Arabic language, which, like, in any case, it wasn't, the Arabic language didn't have real, you know, strong status already, you know, laws having been translated, Speeches in the Knesset haven't been translated. So already the, 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 the status of Arabic language, you know, like for example, broadcasting, public broadcasting in Israel is not, broad, it is not broadcasted in Arabic, it's translated and done only after 12 o'clock in the night. So, you know, let me say the Russian language is stronger than the status of Russian language. So practically, if you will go today with many issues to the Supreme Court, you will be rejected. More than that, you know, like there is a law that says equality. We went against a website that was used to promote uh, employment of Jews only. There is equal opportunities law that, you know, it's part of the achievements of the civil rights movement in Israel. 20 years ago, we did this good job. We went to the court, we said, you know, this website should be shut it down because it's promote only employment of Jews. And there's a law that says it's, it's, it's illegal. It took us years in the courts until somebody was, yeah, and it was before this uh, yeah. new law. So we won the case, compensation of 40,000 shekel with IRA, actually, the Israel Religious Action Center, in solidarity. And today, I'm not sure that we will own the case. Okay, so with the basic law, actually, the historical achievements of the civil rights movement in Israel will be put. Is it apartheid today in the way that South Africa was? I can't say, but we are in the way. If the situation in the occupied territories is worse than the situation in South Africa, in many cases, yes. In many cases, what's going on in, South, in, 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 in the occupied territories is similar, and in some cases is worse. Look at Khan al -Ahmar. and look at al -Aqib. You smile because you know Khalil Ahmad. But most, most international actors don't know that al Aratib was demolished for 150 times. Because we are the Arab minority in democracy. Nobody thought that we are suffering in a way that also in Khalil Ahmad today, the evacuation of Khalil Ahmad is actually has been presented to the international community and it's part of, it, part of the truth that it's, it will end the two-state solution and will uh, divide the West Bank actually. So why you need to demolish unrecognized village in the Negev? Because there is no land. There is enough land. If you were in Israel and you drove from uh, Beersheba to Ilad, you know that it's empty for four hours. So it's not a question of land. It's a question how we will humiliate the humans that are living in these lands. And this is the case of apartheid regime. If we will be silent and we will not build solidarity with the Jewish progressive forces in Israel, yes, because fascism will be happy to see silent people, because then he think that he can be more violent against civilians. And this is the historical experience. This is the Jewish people experience. It's not only our experience. And of course, there are many, many, many uh, examples of 
what is the potential of, of that too? Like if we take Imel Iran and what we, we struggled for Imel Iran and how the Supreme Court has decided about, about Imel, Imel Iran prohibiting from creation of a Jewish uh, only settlement, but then the committee of the Imel Iran has stated to whom they are building, who can be admitted in that, in that and with the admit, admission uh, law, there is a possibility for a committee to decide who is in Tariq and who is not. And in this, and this law enabled the committee to have only uh, uh, an, an ethnic or national uh, 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 criteria for, for admitting in one of the villages. So Qadan uh, case, which we celebrated for many years, is now to say we have we have no Qadans anymore possibility in the in the uh, existing of that law. And similar in other issues that we want to speak about culture, when we speak about language, when we speak about a uh, support of filmmaking, support of, of cultural production and so on and so on and so on. It is only it's uh, only a issue of uh, uh, time. And the question of solidarity with progressive uh, Jewish uh, voices. And here I want to ask ourselves what is progressive? And uh, to, to rethink the concept of progressive Jews. What our experience was that the left in Israel has aligned its discourse and aligned its, its positioning with the right wing. As much as uh, the, when, when the right wing went right, more right and more radical, we saw a more and more uh, Jewish progressive voices are controlling themselves and making censorship about their positioning and positioning themselves so that they will be uh, 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 attracted to the uh, 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 public opinion. And the public opinion went right, so we are more careful with, with our wording, with our positioning, with our, and this, Question: I think this is something that we have been seeing uh, decreasingly de 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 uh, over the years. How this this happen happened, and in many times the uh, 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 audience, when he they wanted to uh, vote for uh, 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 for someone, and they were looking and saying, "Oh, it's very similar." When we're speaking about segregation, and you're speaking about segregation, no, I will go to the origin of the uh, of the uh, idea and the origin uh, is in the right wing so i go to the right wing and i think where we have what, what i'm trying to say today that we need to rethink our uh, uh, networking and solidarity action uh, like uh, we have to uh, 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 build solidarity uh, with a new uh, uh, approach, which the approach of the uh, uh, marginalized communities, approach of uh, trying to connect to marginalized groups and uh, groups that are fighting for their rights. I'll give you an example of Haredi women, for example. Can you imagine any solidarity between a Palestinian woman organization and Haredi women organization? A Haredi women are not progressive in, their, in uh, any of their stereotype mind setting, they are not uh, in the progressive forces and they will not be uh, connected to the progressive forces. But they are women who are struggling within the Haredi community. They are struggling for their rights to be and their rights to be uh, voted for or elected and they are struggling within that community. And for that right, if I connect to my progressive roots, and maybe I will not be able to connect to them. But if I, I, I step backwards and think about my, my values and think about my, my, where I'm standing, what I'm standing for, that these values should be uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, indicator for my, my coalition, for my solidarity, then I would say, okay, they are marginalized, and they are struggling for their, uh, against their marginalization. And as such, I will support their demands for their rights within that community. And I do make solidarity with it. So this is one other way of dealing with the, with, with the issue. And I suggest for us, 
and for, for our community to be more of that kind of solidarity. Strengthen the, and to empower citizens by uh, citizen groups who are marginalized to struggle for their, against their marginalization and to build a coalition, a network of marginalized, not of progressive, but for, of marginalized, of struggling people because we are all struggling against a system which discriminates us all and which use us all. So we have to, to think in different in different way. And this means that we are we could reach out for the uh, citizens who are Sephardi uh, Jews, who are Ethiopian, uh, uh, who are uh, uh, Russian in the Russian community, and of course Haredi, Haredi, especially Haredi women who are really uh, uh, organizing. This means also that to strengthen that voice of and to regain confidence of our ability as citizens and citizen group to uh, uh, struggle against the oppression of any kind of oppression is something that we need to strengthen. And this, this is a new way of looking at the issue, not from a progressive lens, but from value uh, 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 system uh, related uh, uh, indicators. Thank you both. So I'm looking at my watch here, and I'm seeing that the time is proceeding apace with us. And I, I, I want to make sure that we do reserve time for your questions and discussion. So with res in respecting that, I think what I will do is I will ask you two more questions uh, that, that are burning on my mind and ask you to address those together. And then we'll, we'll open the floor for discussion. Um, okay, here are my, my two questions. I want to talk, uh, I want to ask you, first of all, about uh, where all of this is going legally uh, following the uh, passage of the nation state law. Um, I want to mention that we have already had, uh, as Jafar mentioned, we've already started to see the impact of this law within the courts. And I, I just want to point out uh, one example. Uh, that occurred 10 days ago on September 17th. Uh, you had a Jerusalem district judge, Moshe Dori, uh, who assessed punitive damages to a Jewish Israeli who was injured in a terror attack by Hamas, and he specifically cited the nation state law. He cited Clause 6A of the nation state law as rationale for providing a Jew with additional compensation for harm to his safety. Uh, the relevant provision here, 6A, states that the state will strive to ensure the safety of the members of the Jewish people in trouble or in captivity due to the fact of their Jewishness or their citizenship. Uh, this led Gidon Levy of Haaretz to proclaim uh, in a very sharply worded op-ed that Israel now has a race law. So I would ask you, uh, if you, if you would, if you had any comments on that, uh, which I expect that you might, uh, and what other applications of the nation state law do you expect might occur next? Uh, if you like, uh, feel free to comment on any on the up court, upcoming court challenges. Uh, I believe there are eight that have been filed before the Supreme Court. How do you think those will go? Uh, and then finally, uh, it seems like I have more like three questions here. My apologies, you guys can field any of these that you like and, and then I promise we will open it up. Um, I do wanna talk about internationalizing your strategy. It's no accident uh, that you two are here in the United States. Uh, you are obviously seeking the support of uh, Americans, including American Jews, uh, and I'm sure Arab Americans as well. Uh, and I'd like to hear about what, what part internationalization plays in your strategy. Is it because you feel like you've reached a dead end domestically in Israel, or you're pursuing uh, two different prongs? Take it away, thanks. Uh, I think that uh, uh, our inter international uh, struggle or work with the international, I mean, we always saw the, that uh, Israel is not uh, a uh, uh, separate uh, identity and it's not, it's related to the region and it's related to the world and what's happening here and it impact uh, 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 our situation. And we just seeing the change here in the administration, how it's impacting our daily life, actually, and our our uh, 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 struggle. So, uh, but uh, I think over the years, the accumulation of 
that was that experience, especially it was from civil society who was using the uh, uh, international tools like the uh, uh, human rights uh, uh, um, uh, organization, like Women Rights, who we are since 97 actually uh, presenting the uh, CEDAW Commission with report, with gather report as Palestinian uh, NGOs. Since 97, we are writing each time a Israel writes a report about the status of, of uh, women inside Israel. We start we writing a gather report to show where is the uh, uh, convention is going. So it was part of that of that uh, uh, work. The new uh, strategy that the uh, or the new uh, um, uh, steps is is again is the work together between civil society organization and the uh, political parties. And this is maybe Jaffa can share with you the experience that they had two weeks ago in Geneva with the political leaders. And uh, but I think this is a step in this step where not only civil society organizations are using the platform of international uh, uh, advocacy, but also the uh, political leaders, which also uh, uh, present the our awareness of new status that we are we are in, and that the struggle can be only within uh, within Israel. I mean, it is the same similar process we went in the peace uh, movement. For years, we were struggling in the peace movement inside Israel, and until we said, alone we can do it, and we were beginning to, be, to build uh, partners in the, in the uh, US and in Europe, and, 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 and you, know, you know that uh, process, most of you know that, that process, how it's went, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, actually uh, uh, working in, in, uh, in uh, some degree. We couldn't uh, promote the, uh, the peace as we wanted, because we are not only the only players, and the issue is that how we struggling back. And I think one of the learning that we what what the, we are we are uh, seeing today is to learn from that experience and to reflect on that experience and to reflect on the tools and the ways that we did in and where we failed and why. To not to fail again in the same in the same mistakes that we uh, did uh, before, but I think this is this is essential in in uh, working with, and especially because Trump's administration and Netanyahu administration and all the the uh, 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 right wing are are very well connected and are very well coordinated and are very well in solidarity with each other, but. The uh, other forces, the forces who are against this uh, direction, are not networking, are not cooperating. We continue to work in delegation. We continue to put uh, 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 a border between uh, my struggle and your struggle, peace now, and, and the peace camp, the other peace camp inside Israel, or the other, uh, the, uh, uh, between the peace camp in Israel and the uh, uh, minority rights between these, I mean, what we have been practicing in segregating our struggles is one of the biggest mistakes that we've been doing, is not to see that the uh, social justice movement, when, when what it was created, didn't make the connection between the fact that there is some, some of it, that the criteria uh, groups did the connection between the occupation and the uh, price of the cheese of the cottage in in, uh, in inside Israel, they but most of the people struggled against the price raise without because it's it's uh, 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 hurt their uh, economic status as middle class, not the not the poor. The poor were were able to see where it's going. They were able to see that it's. The, the money uh, is going uh, to the military and to the settlement and to not to the priority of the citizens of, of Israel, but uh, they, we, we didn't manage to work together. And this is the issue. It is a, this is the biggest question. Could we create new networks? Could we work in a solidarity? This is the, the, the this is the something that we're trying here to uh, bring this voice is we need to work in solidarity. We need to work in cooperation. Your platform, your network should be in support to our, our uh, struggle, and our struggle should be connected to 
your, your solid, and only in this way, by feeding each other and solidarity with each other and working together, we have chance for a, uh, to make our discourse and to make our uh, agenda presence and achieve something and not continue the hierarchy of suffering and the hierarchy of struggle and to go against this, this hierarchy. This is the demand of today. Look, after being arrested for almost 50 hours with my uh, son. <laughs> and having your leg broken. And having my leg broken. You know the story? I was, uh, uh, yeah, the first time that I was arrested, I was 18 years old. This time I was arrested by my, my son. He's 18 years old. It's also. I have this whole thoughts about like, what's going on in this country. You know, I'm not the same kid of 18 years old. And it was clear for me that similar to what happened in October, Today they control, it's not, you know, in 2000, Ruth Barak was the prime minister, the left was. Today they control, the settlers control the government, control the secret service, and control the court. And the parliament. And the police. Don't have any illusion. Okay? I hear Chaked nominate judges to the Supreme Court. You know, we hear what's going on here also in the in, in, in the US. So these guys, not like our friends in the progressive forces in Israel, they think a big time and you know, like, you know, we don't know what to do with the Arabs. You know, the Arabs didn't vote enough. So the whole game is a game of like, we, the settlers, are going to control with our apartheid vision. And we will oppress you, and we'll put you in the jails, and break your leg. That's the vision of the settlers. If you open your mouth as Jafar Farah or as Batsalim, you will be beaten, and will be jailed. We, we saw that. I saw it on my body. Now, it's either we will say, okay, you know, like, like yesterday, or we say, look, between now and the next election, we have to fight. And we have to change the discourse in Israel. That's, that's, that's our options. I don't want to see my son in the age of 50 being arrested and beaten with his son. I don't want to see that. So in this sense, you ask us where we are going, there is two tracks. Or we will go to the next election in Israel to put equality and to put democracy and to put a, a, a peace on the agenda. Or we will go to escalation, targeting the Arab community. The settlers want to target the Arab community because we are the core actors, the core actors of democracy and peace building and anti occupation This is the core, we are 20%. Now we fail to understand how we can be proactive. And we trusted our Jewish friends in the peace camp. They know better than us what is wrong in the Jewish community. No, they don't know. The maximum that we and they can get, and we are getting with $15 million of the V15, plus 55 in case if you include Yair Lapid with that, all the opposition. If you want to do things different, it's our obligation and responsibility to outreach to the Russian community, to outreach to the Sephardi community, and not to wait for one minute to the Ashkenazi left leaders that failed with us to access the Jewish home. It's, you know, the settlers, they know how to get majority. They keep telling us, vote better. No, it's about time to, for us to work in the Jewish community and to convince the Jewish Sephardi that there is no reason why they should work for the Likud with downgrading the status of the Arabic language. There is no reason. And, and when it comes to social justice, social justice will not be implemented in Israel if you have to pay the price of the occupation. Somebody has to pay it up. Why the, houses, the, the uh, housing prices going up? Somebody has to fill 
the state budget. So if you ask about international community, look, the OECD, the US is part, everybody does, is investing in Israel, a lot of Jewish Americans are investing in Israel. Have to know, Israel is not sustainable, and there will not be economic growth without 25% of the labor, which are the Arab youth. We, the 20, because the Haredi is getting up, they are leaving the job market, our youth are going to the job market, that's why the Minister of Treasury in Israel and the business community in Israel understand that the Arab community is important. Go and look at the OECD reports. Since 2010, they always say, if you want to ensure economic growth in Israel, invest in the Arab community. So from one side, you have people in the Ministry of Treasure, you have people in the uh, business side, you have a lot of people that understand the importance of the Arab community, but you have the settlers groups that are taking the political agenda and the legislation. I don't want to wait to the court. I want to, I want to invest in knocking the doors of the Jewish community. During our arrest, every police officer, from my child to everybody, everybody that was at jail, we were sitting there for 50 hours and talking to each police officer about how much he paid for housing. And that he's a friar, that he's oppressing us and serving Netanyahu that don't, don't know which, which kind of champagne will, will, will drink in that time. The corruption in Israel and the occupation are going together. And it's about time that we feel free to outreach the Jewish community, tough, clear, and also to that Jewish Israelis in parallel. If somebody has to do the work in Israel, we have to understand that people in Europe and people in the US are not satisfied that Israel is still occupying and discriminating and making such pieces of legislation. And the first ones that we hold, not only responsible, we hold them responsible and partners are the Jewish people and this law talk about them. It's the abuse of you as Jewish people that sit here and they want to protect you. No, they put you as Jewish Americans in risk when they target us in this way. All right, I want to open the floor up for questions and I'd like you to keep your questions succinct and of course uh, make sure that they are questions. Uh, so we'll begin here in the front with this gentleman. Do you want to just tell us your name? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Richard Letterman. I, I was just curious, uh, given the vision of democracy that both of you, uh, you know, uh, uh, described, what are your thoughts about a one-state democratic Israel-Palestine? Can you take a few questions, or one by one? Uh, one by one. One by one. That's, it's a very easy one. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very easy one. That it's a very easy one. You know, like, it was, for many years, it was Palestinians' struggle to get, you know, the international community to say, Palestinians have, you know, you remember, right. Golda yeah, Meir? It was the PLO. Golda Meir yeah. said there is no Palestinians. Right. We shifted the discourse. You know, with all uh, what, what we, we talk about, we shifted the discourse. Everybody knows that there is a Palestinian people, and there is self-determination, the right of the Palestinian people in building the state. We will not be the one to offer Netanyahu the settlers, uh, uh, you know, exit. If the Jewish people don't want to say solution, let them say, you know, Belgium is very nice exercise. You can go to the Spanish exercise, okay? Flemish, French, Germans, in you know, they find they always negotiate constitution. If the Jewish Israelis don't want to say solution, because the settlers don't want to say solution. Let them come to the table of the international community. I think there is different ways to do one state solution. Let's talk about it. But we will not be the ones to offer the Israelis, Easy the settlers, Easy the exit. Okay, let the international community, you know, I was happy to see Trump yesterday. We don't mind. It will be one, two, one state or two state, no matter. Yesterday, father, suddenly, he liked the idea. So, if he likes the idea, let him convince his friends to implement the idea. Why we should give the, the Netanyahu the exit? Please, you know, like, if you as Jewish Americans or Jewish Israelis don't want this solution, say to the, tell it to the international community. Why you ask us, the Palestinians, 
to give up the dream until all these years of struggle to start now to tell the international community, ah, oh, yes, no, we don't know, no. Two state solution, this is what the Palestinians want. If the Jewish Israelis don't want because of the settlers, let them come to Trump and tell him we don't want two state solution. Okay, great. Uh, Harold, you have the next. Howard, my bad. You have the next question, Howard. Excuse me. Howard, something. Uh, two kind of quick questions in the short of my video. I mean, immediately after the passing of the law, there was a very vocal outcry from the Druze community, in particular from Druze military officers, who are, in fact, very important to the IDF. And I wonder how you see that impacting the political struggle. And secondly, um, a few months ago, a group of Palestinians and leftist Israelis put together effort to, to, to mount a slate of candidates for the Jerusalem municipal elections. And just a couple of days ago, Aziz Abbasara, who had been put up as the mayoral candidate, withdrew yes. because he had so much opposition, uh, partly from the Israeli government, but really, I think, frightening opposition from the Palestinian community. And so what is what does that say about how these political alliances might go and how Palestinians might participate? Uh, I think uh, the first question is uh, um, the Jews. The, about the Jewish community. I mean, the the, the uh, outrageous uh, uh, reaction from the Jewish community is very, very understandable and uh, very, uh, um, and it, it, it has a good uh, uh, sounding in the, in the Israeli uh, media, but and in Israeli public opinion. And uh, quickly they were trying to find a way out. And uh, this way out is, is something to make another special agreement within, within uh, to, to the people who serve in the army, which again is not discussing the, uh, uh, the uh, essence of, of that uh, law, but trying to make uh, a so that will make us the third class citizen instead of second class citizen. So the second class citizen will be the uh, Jews and Bedouin who are serving in the army and then the other uh, Palestinian community. But I think uh, one of the uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, um, cases that are, this, this is coming from the Jews community. There are one, one from the Palestinian community, one from uh, I, I don't know if the Mizrahi had the, yes, also the they submitted, yeah. So the Mizrahi, one name was the Mizrahi. So they, and they all, uh, and Meretz has uh, one, but they all, the, the uh, Minister of Justice was very, very upset about the fact that the Supreme Court uh, accepted the uh, cases and have a date for, for uh, discussion. But I think if we put all our efforts in, in that uh, process, it, it, uh, it, it's not going to work. We have to work on different levels and on different to struggle against the, the law. So I think that that uh, uh, the there were in the Druze community some voices who were connecting, trying to connect to the general, uh, 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 but there were the weak. Uh, voices, the, the more moderate voices, more the, the majority voices, were ready to accept a solution for that make their uh, uh, status uh, organized in a different way. Government can, can have an exit on, on that uh, situation with the loose community. They can include equality in any basic law. You know, it's very easy. You know, it's not common that Israel will have equality in basic law. It will not happen because of the Haredi problems. Uh, I don't think that, uh, that the Palestinians against Jerusalem should accept that position. Uh, part of the resistance is to deny. Project, uh, the city council and to say we are not represented by the city council. I would say more than this. Imagine that the art community at a certain point will say we are, we will disengage from the 
that is not every 50 minutes. This is something that will depend. But will we disengage from the democratic, from the fake democracy, from the political game that is there? Today, there is a huge pressure on the political leadership of the Arab community to boycott the next election. There is calls to the Arab members of the Knesset to leave the Knesset. Now, from the community. In the last election, it wasn't easy to get 63% of the Arab community to vote. You know, you give legitimacy to a regime to discriminate. And you can fight, and you can struggle. But there's also other ways, after 70 years of struggle, that we are doing through the political participation. We were 95% who participated in the election, and today we are 63%. One of the strategies that are considered by the Palestinian community today in Israel is to boycott the election and to embarrass Israel internationally when it comes whether Israel is a democracy or not. This is not an easy decision. The decision of the Palestinian people to boycott the election in East Jerusalem is something that has been debated for years. It's not a personal decision. Now I have the mood to be a candidate and go and elect. There's a Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel that are living in East Jerusalem. They can vote. But the Palestinians that have been annexed to, East, to Israel as part of this whole annexation legislation that is not, you know, every, everything can be legal in Israel. You have majority, you, can, you, you say apartheid, you discriminate. It's legal to discriminate. Israel, it's legal. So it's legal to occupy in Israel. So imagine that. Tomorrow we'll decide that the, you know, like a few villages around settlements will be annexed to Israel. You know, this, is, this is part of the struggle. So I think, you know, the whole uh, illusion, we will serve in the army, we will get rights. No, you will not get rights. This is the proof. You know, we like it actually, because these people have been living for seven years with illusion of equality. And they were, they suffered from land uh, confiscation, from illegal houses, from this systematic discrimination, and from violence. And suddenly they discover that they are Arabs. So it's about time to tell everyone in Israel, it's not only if you serve in the army or not. Israel is shrinking spaces also for democratic forces in Israel and the Jewish. So it's about time that all of us unite, unite ourselves and come back to this struggle and say, no, East Jerusalem is not part of Israel. East Jerusalem is part of the future of Palestine. The occupied territories is not something that you can, because it's against international law. And discriminating the Palestinian community in Israel is not accepted. We have to go back to the values that we should, should be the basis of us, our struggle. And, and some people in the way, you know, they offered me when I was arrested, you know, five days, home, jail, go back home. You know, and be fine. And, 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 and my, my, my children and everybody else, all the other 20, will be in the jail. But Jafar Farah will be released because Mogherini was saying, how you arrested human rights defender? I said, no, there is a price. There is a price to be citizen of the state of Israel, Palestinian citizen. And I think that rules that serve in the army, they pay triple price. Triple price, because they, they die, they are treated as, it, as, as traitors, and they don't get any benefits as a result of this, or be uh, part of a regime that oppresses their people. Question over here. Yeah, I want to bring this Sorry, I'm to Ross Anthony for his name. Um, I want to turn this a bit because you know, one of the interesting things said earlier that this is an election between democracy and uh, being a, a Jewish state. And uh, as, as you, it's really a little bit different. It wasn't yeah. said democracy and Jewish state. It was said democracy or separation? Democracy or separation, okay. But, but the, along with democracy comes a, a struggle for rights. We've talked a lot about struggle. 
But along with uh, Julie being a, a Julie state or not not being separated, in the long run, you get to a point where right now there's a majority population uh, Palestinian, east of the you know, west of the Jordan River. You can cut it how you want, but you know there's, there's a large number of Palestinians that are part of the population. So what that means in the long run is apartheid. I think that's the, the struggle that's probably going to be more successful. But the idea of struggle, which you have emphasized many, many times, hasn't worked. It seems to me, I think that other than doubling down on that, you might want to think about other ways to go about it. And I'm, I'm in, I'm, I also look at the more recent polling that finds that the youth, particularly um, Arab Israeli youth, is more and more viewing this uh, not so much as a two-state solution as their preferred option, but as a, um, an equal rights. So I wonder if you'll comment about that, because that's a different political approach than Pursued so far, and uh, I'm not sure. I'm actually too bad, but I would be interested in your comment. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, traffic is beginning to be a bad word. <laughs> uh, I think it's not about uh, the struggle, it's about what you're struggling for and how you struggle for. And what one of the things that I try to, to promote is to reflect on and to learn from our experiences. Even when we fail in some of our struggles that we took uh, 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 on our agenda, even when we fail, like the peace, struggle for peace in, in the uh, region, uh, and we fail, uh, even when we fail, what we learn from it, and how to use what we learn from it for the future uh, struggle. I think the alternative for, uh, for uh, the, the alternative in the, to struggle is struggle. Uh, but in a different way. Yes, I agree. It's, and, and there are different ways of struggle. I it used to say, even the fact that we have some youth who are now uh, integrated in some uh, workplaces, in, in, uh, they, they, they did it by their own and without any support from uh, uh, the uh, or policy toward their their uh, uh, positioning in the. In the market in the labor market but they struggled for it and they achieved it in their in their own individual struggle and one of the issues that i'm saying is always when you struggle alone you you may achieve things but when you struggle together and when you bring uh, the forces together you you may achieve much more and you are uh, uh, the, 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 you're making the change not for it only for you but for, for uh, others, and you are changing the infrastructure. So what, what I think that, uh, for me, uh, uh, struggle has been, and still, uh, the agenda that we should uh, resist and of any, any uh, group that is discriminated against or any marginalized uh, need to uh, connect to their voices, connect to their power, and to organize for, for, for change. This is my, my belief, and I'm, I say normally I'm not privileged to think differently. I need to see that there is a hope at the end of the tunnel. I need to see that my work and our work could change the reality. And this is about, about, about it. So I, I am a person who normally looks for hope and uh, reflect on their role of, bring, of keeping that hope uh, continuing. I think we have uh, time probably for just one more. Well, I'll tell you what, here's what we'll do. I see two questions. Yeah? Why don't you both throw out your questions, be very quick, and maybe we can have quick answers. Thanks. So, I was going to ask this, almost, it's already been asked, it's kind of going to circle back to the idea of one state versus two state solution. It seems hard to me. I just wonder what your thoughts are on how it's possible to build a coalition of people saying we need to unite, we need to work together, and at the same time say ultimately the goal is to be separate. Um, so I wonder if you could elaborate on how how it's possible to unite those two Got it. segments. Got it. Great. Thanks. Um, Stephen Stern, I heard you talk about uh, areas of work and areas of opportunity, and the areas of work have to do with linking with all the marginalized communities um, within Israel. And then, also, and then there's an, also an understanding of a demand to 
seen as an indigenous minority and a, co and a connection uh, to the occupation. Uh, you had 55 votes against the nation state law, many of them within the Israeli Jewish community who I don't think are quite with you in terms of seeing the occupation the same way or indigenous minority. And the linkage to the social justice work you do also has some difficulties with that. That whole mixture of your work, where do you see these opportunities for solidarity ahead, specific things that you want to do and that we can help with over here? Okay, great, thanks. Uh, okay, I think that uh, to understand the reality and the difference among in, in the construction of the communities, and that we're not speaking about the Jewish community and the Palestinian community, we're speaking about the different interests within that community and the different interests within the Palestinian community. To see the diversity among ourselves is, is a major issue. And uh, to see that many of us are living in marginalized communities and marginalized situations is another, another step. But uh, it is essential for uh, any solidarity is to come from activists, from people who are acting upon their marginalization. It's not enough to be in a mar marginalized to be able to connect to others. To be able to connect to others, you have to feel your power, you have to feel your ability of change. And this is the something, I mean, when we discussed the situation for years, we were saying that most of the citizens of Israel, in the Jewish community as well as in the Arab community, are disempowered, right? We have been saying that and repeatedly. They are, don't feel that they can change the uh, some, some game, they can't, and we prove for several years that we couldn't uh, change the, the sum game. 55 against the, the, the majority for the last 20 years, right? So one of the, the uh, options is to think in a different, again, to think in a different way. Since we analyze it in strategic thinking, you analyze the reality, and then you build your vision, and then you build your steps. And one of the steps is, if the reality is so divided, and is so much in the group are so marginalized, why not invest in these groups that are marginalized to organize themselves and to offer these groups and the idea that, that we're coming with is we have, as Palestinian community, for the last 25 years, we developed a very strong infrastructure in civil society. We have a lot of experience in building our own organization. And this we can offer to some of these marginalized groups. If we can offer that as Palestinian, and if we come with these abilities as Palestinian, not as someone from abroad, not as someone with a special uh, 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 foreign agenda, but as, as, and come and work with these community too, uh, and support them, like what I, what, what I did explain about the Haredi woman. This, what, when we built this coalition with the Haredi woman, I'm sure it is the basis for future cooperation. We are from our differences, but we, I supported them in uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court case. When they went to Supreme Court, we were one of the organizations that signed for their uh, Supreme Court. We were in the discussion group with, with them before we were able to meet together and to think and to begin uh, networking with the community of the Haredi women. We, at the beginning, it was on the, within the leadership uh, uh, level, but then we brought it to our communities and we established a forum of cooperation and building together. So it's need to strategize in a different way. And this is one way that we are offering. And yes, you can support that, that uh, endeavor. In, in, and yes, you can, you can uh, if you believe in this strategy, and if we, we are here to, to offer this, this strategy for a future possibility of building new networks and new cooperation, and that with the differences that we have, with respecting these differences is the major, and building upon not as a, for until now, the uh, uh, left in Israel has looked at the Palestinian community as a pool of voters, and is looking at the Sephardi community as a pool of voters, and is looking at the uh, 
uh, Russian community as pool of, uh, of water. And what we are saying, you have to look at us in a different way. We are looking at these, these different groups as groups who have identity, who has history, different than ours, different than interests, different than our, our, our others, but the tools to change the situation are the same tools. Organizing, 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 networking, 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 cooperation, 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 and this is what we think that it is possible to change the uh, some game in the future. Just uh, less, less thoughts, yes, for now. You asked how, to, how it's possible to help. Uh, that's, yes, that's where I did. One of your questions, very short answer. Make your work here. The other answer, help us to bring the voice of the Palestinian community, but it's not enough. We need to bring the Sephardi community here. Okay, $10 million that have been given for years by the American administration for peace building, all of them are allocated to our same friends on the Israeli left that failed again and again to bring the voices of the Sephardi and the Russian communities. It's not enough to get the 61 seats. You talk about separation, no, I don't want separation. The proposal for peace that we are promoted is based on inclusion of the Arab Jewish community inside the Middle East. The Jews are not isolated from the Middle East. They try to isolate us, the settlers try to isolate us from, the, from Israel. Our proposal is to help the Jewish Israelis to be part of the region for the first time, to open the borders, to talk about peace of reconciliation, not peace of separation. To build democracy in Israel, it means that Israel will be open with open borders. We have 5,000 students that study in Jenin American University, citizens of the state of Israel, but we can't build university. Why? Not because of the right wing. It started from the left wing. The left wing. You know, Jewish American organizations here don't want to listen to us. They know that the work will be done without the Sephardi community, without the Russians. They know. They come here, they come to Israel, and they feed before the election, Yallah, we will get the 61 seats. It will not work like this. We know the Jews better than you guys here, and better than anybody else, any other Palestinian. We are coming here. Next time, you ask what you can help. Next time, we want to bring around the table Sephardi leaders that will be an alternative to Kahlon and his party. And we want to bring Russian leaders that will be alternative. You know, the only thing, the only good, the only good news from the last election was that the leaders of the Arab civil society that were able to build the joint list, they will be, they will be, you know, the, they became the third political group. Islamic movements will come and sit together and try to build the future together. This is a new way that it's not easy at all. It's not easy, it's the only exercise in the whole Middle East. But I want to see how we will put on the agenda the inclusion of the Jews in the Middle East and stop telling us, oh, you are a minority. No, the Jewish people are the minority. They are a minority in the Middle East. If they want to be part of the Middle East, this law is isolating the Jews, not only us. And we want to throw this law to the basket and to build a new vision that will say, Israel and the Jewish Israelis will become like us, will become part of the Middle East, and the Middle East will not be forest. The Middle East should be a place that will be building, will be able to build women rights, democracy, equality, and etc. So the whole vision that we are coming, you know, we are free today from Jewish superiority. Nobody is telling us what to say. I want the Jews to be part of the Middle East. This whole isolation and segregation didn't work for 70 years. And for the question of the gentleman here about effective and about, uh, you know, lasting. When I was jailed, there was a, jail, there was a, 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 a press interview with me. And I said, you know, for years we were doing a lot. But this week was very effective. The week of my arrest 
and what happened in the Israeli media, talking about police violence, talking about, you know, international, finally, the inter Mogherini is calling to release me. Finally, she talked about something related to the, you know, the advisor of the U.S., of Trump, the U.S. US ambassador, came to see her to talk about what's going on. We were very effective in this week. If we will even be arrested, we can be more effective than the people are, that are suffering in Gaza from, from the isolation. The added value of the Palestinian in Israel, we have linguistic, physical, and mental accessibility to the Jews and Palestinians and the Arabs. This is added value that has been undermined by the PLO and by the Jewish Progressive Forces, and we have to stop being, you know, to apologize. No, we are core actors, and we will act as core actors, and we are targeted by the settlers, and we will target the settlers because they are fascist and not democratic group that occupy other people's land and other people's life, and they want to do it also on us in the scientific life, and it's possible to win. On that note, <laughs> I would like to thank Jafar and Nabila so much for joining us today. Jafar, may you not need to be arrested and have your leg broken to continue making progress in the struggle. Well, I am ready, I am ready for this scenario because it happened when I was yeah. also yeah. these days. But I'm ready. We we wish we you know that this is the direction. We wish you much luck you. in your trip and here in the United States. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to all of you.